All right, class, you've got a Bible today, John chapter number 14. John chapter number 14 today is where we find our, our lesson, and I hope you've got a Bible with you today. You can follow along in the reading of Scripture today, and uh, I've entitled our, our lesson today, Oh, What a Promise. Oh, What a Promise from John chapter number 14. We've now reached a place in the life of Christ that it is the night before his crucifixion, chapter 13, Jesus shared the Passover meal with his disciples. We read about that. And he transformed that Passover meal into what we know as the Lord's Supper. During the supper, he set a tremendous example for all of us in the washing of his disciples' feet to show that what it would be like to be a servant of Jesus Christ. As the disciples listened to Jesus predict his betrayal, Peter's denial, and his going away, they were no doubt terrified. Can you imagine living in the days of Christ, seeing him, being with him, watching him do all these great and miraculous things, and now he has an announcement that he's going away. Well, where are you going? Well, the story gets even more complex, and then Jesus has to explain in chapter number 14 where he's going and how we can get there. When Jesus sees the fear in their faces, and no doubt it was evident, he tells them what we're going to read in chapter 14. And here we're going to read in John chapter 14 very familiar passages of Scripture. In fact, when you start reading John chapter 14, many times you think of uh, a funeral service where someone has gone on and we begin to, to talk about Jesus and where he's at and how we can go to be with him. We talk about this in light of the fact that for you and I today as believers in Jesus Christ, our future is very bright. Amen, class? Our future is very bright. The best is yet to come for those who know God. So we see, beginning in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6, uh, here's what the Bible says. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in, in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Now, if I, and I'm obviously not going to, if I were to stop right at verse number three, there's the blessing of the day right there, amen? There's the blessing of the day. That he's gone to prepare a place, and he's coming back again, to receive us unto himself. Verse 4, And whether I go you know, and the way you know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not where you go, and how can we know the way? Now listen, before we begin to get too critical about Thomas and other Bible characters, I would suggest if I had been there, I would have been asking questions too, Amen. You see, we have the advantage today of having the completed work of God the, and the completed Word of God, right? These guys were living it out day by day. So when Jesus says he's leaving, I've got some questions. So would you. Jesus said unto him, you know this verse, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man come to the Father but by me. Oh, what a promise that the writer gives us. And Jesus speaks these words to us. You see, in reality, life here and now is many times just a series of, of problems, challenges. It's a series of learning lessons. It's a series of storms. And some of those can be very terrifying. Let's face it. There are problems that you and I have faced through life that without God's help, we would have never got over them, we would have never got through them, right class? But with God's help, we made it. In the book of Job, chapter number 5, verse number 7, uh, the writer there put it like this. He says, Yet man is born unto trouble as the sparks fly upward. The Bible also says that man's days in the here and now can be few and full of trouble. In Job chapter 5, 
Job was re referring to a, a roaring fire in which the flames and the smoke and the combustion of it caused the fire and sparks to fly upward. When terrifying trouble comes our way, we need to remember these words that I just read. Now, preaching this and living this are two little different things. Amen? Right, class? But here's what Jesus says. He says, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. It's what he says in verse number one. Here is the first step in considering our future and the assurance of it. No matter how frightened we are, our faith in God and our trust in Jesus Christ will calm our fears and calm our storms. It is no wonder today that when people face life without God and they have no hope in Christ, they do not have a belief in Christ, they won't trust God, it's no wonder that they go to all the wrong places to try to find relief from their fears. Amen? I can fully understand it. But for the people who know God today, man, we have a hope beyond all hopes this world knows anything about. We have something today that, that the world does not have. And we can put our trust in Him. Psalm 125, verse number 1, describes how we trust the Lord. The Bible says this, They that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be moved and abideth forever. Can I tell you today the reason that I have confidence in my God today? to calm my fears and to quell my storms is because I have trusted Him fully and He has always done for me in the past what I could not do for myself. And He's going to continue to do that until the day of Jesus Christ, which I believe, by the way, could be today. Let not your heart be troubled. He's coming back, class. Amen? I mean, it's the great hope of all hopes today. Jesus Christ could return even today. Next, Jesus says this, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Now listen, I'm glad the God of creation, who one day spoke into existence this universe, is the same God who is preparing heaven for you and I. I've got a real big confidence and a real big faith that what God is, is, is constructing and building in heaven for the believer, we cannot describe today. And I believe heaven is going to be on our description when we get there. That's how good I believe heaven is. You know why? Because after all, God is building the mansions there, amen? He's the, he's the one that's gone to prepare. And by the way, he's been gone a good while, amen? He's been gone a good while. I go to prepare a place for you. The word mansions has given some the idea that heaven will have individual homes. However, if you study the word of God closely, you find the word translated mansions there is a word uh, that we would get more like uh, rooms. I believe today that there are many rooms and they may be mansions for all I know. I just know that God is the builder and if God's the builder, I want to be on, on the inside of it. Amen? I want to be on the inside of it. We see today that God tries to give us hope, just as he did the disciples of his day. And he tried to calm their fears in telling them that he was leaving. But one day, thank God, he was coming back. Of course, his coming back, we know as the rapture of the church. And then a few, a few years later, the second coming, Christ coming to this earth. This statement makes it clear, and this is huge today, folks. This statement in verses 1 through 6 makes it crystal clear today that not, not all religions lead to God. There's only one. And it's not a religion. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen? It's a relationship with Him. Jesus is not a way, and this is where 
Uh, we differ from a lot of religions and, and concepts in our world today. Jesus is not a way. The Bible says he is the way. Amen? He's not just a, an option, A, B, and C. He is the only way. That's why Jesus, Jesus made it clear when he says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. How much clearer could Christ have made it? You see, there's only one way. It's Jesus. There's only one way to God. It's Jesus. The road to heaven is one way. It's called the Jesus Street. Amen? It's Jesus plus nothing and minus nothing. Right, class? It's not Jesus plus your money and your works and your attendance and whatever you want to fill in the blank. That's not it. It's not Jesus and minus anything. It is Jesus Christ, one way, Him and Him alone. Man, I'm glad God's plan of salvation was made clear and it's easy for us to understand today. You either have Jesus or you don't. Amen? You either have Him, you either know Him, or you don't. Not only is He the way, the Bible says Jesus is the truth, which means He is the source of all reliable knowledge about God. If you want to know anything about God the Father, learn God the Son. Amen? The Bible says Jesus is the life which means he gives eternal life, eternal life, forever life to those who trust him as Lord and Savior. So the only way to God in verses 1 through 6 is plain. The only way to God is through Jesus Christ. Man, what a promise, what a hope, what assurance we have when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. Secondly, in verses 7 through verses 14, we see we are to remember the Lord's promise. Let's look at verses 7 through verses 14 now from John chapter 14. He says this in verse number 7. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also, and from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Here's another Bible character having questions. Just like Thomas, now Philip. He wants some explanation. He wants some answers. Jesus responds in verse number 9. He says, Jesus says unto him, Have I been so long with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? In other words, Philip, can you not get the picture here? I've told you. I've lived before you. Do you not put it together yet? He that hath seen me, verse 9, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Verse 10, Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me the works that I do, he shall do also, and greater works than these uh, shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever ye ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Verse 14. Another great promise verse. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Here we see we are to remember the Lord's promise. And by the way, when the Lord makes a promise, He always comes through. Agreed, class? When the Lord makes a promise, He's always coming through on it. Jesus now begins to reaffirm His deity by saying in verse 7, if ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. This is what verse 14 is conveying to us. It means Jesus 
is the visible man manifestation of God the Father. That's who Jesus is. He is God in human flesh. Amen? He is God and He is man. Here in verse 14, Jesus is making it plain that He is the, the visible, I can see you, God now, manifestation of God the Father. And guess what? Philip doesn't quite understand all of that. We probably wouldn't have either. G Philip doesn't understand what Jesus says when he says that he and the Father are one. So he says, Lord, show us the Father and it will suffice or it will satisfy us. In other words, Lord, show us. I can imagine that that request would have disappointed Jesus and here's why. Because Philip, I believe, had been with him for three years yet. And yet he doesn't get the complete picture of who Jesus really is. Therefore, Jesus says this to Philip. Have I been so long with you, and hast thou not known me? Philip questions, and he says, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. How sayest us then, show us the Father? If you've ever wondered what God is like, take a close look at Jesus Christ. Amen? If you've ever wondered what God the Father is like, take a, take a close look at what Jesus looks like in His Word. In the midst of these circumstances, in the midst of the circumstances surrounding the, the story as it unfolds here, we, like the disciples of their day, want more assurance. We ask God to do this or that, and it will be enough to reassure us. However, we need to remember this one great concept. And if there's one thing I want you to remember from Sunday school today, here's what it is. God is not in the business of explaining. He is in the business of sustaining. Amen? I'm sure when he's trying to explain to his disciples, the closest of followers of his days, that he was leaving and that he was coming back, that they did not comprehend it completely. Many times God does not explain to us everything that goes on in our lives. But can we all say amen to this? That even though he doesn't explain everything, to the smallest of details, He always sustains us through them. Amen? We may not get it all, but He's always there. We may not see the plan unfolding as He does, but He always knows what's best, and He lays it out before us. There's a couple of verses I memorized years ago in Proverbs chapter 3, and maybe these verses... Uh, maybe these verses today uh, ring true to your heart. Maybe these are even your, your verses for your life. In Proverbs chapter 3, the Bible says, In all thy ways acknowledge who? Him. And guess what happens when we do that? He's going to direct our paths, amen? He's going to direct our paths. Can I always see the road God has laid out for me clearly? No, sometimes it's very foggy. Raise your hand, amen. Sometimes the fog's really thick out there. But I can navigate it, and He can direct my paths, and He can be my light, and He can guide my life. And I may not understand it all. I may not comprehend it all till the coming day of Jesus Christ. But I have this great promise. Number one, He's coming back. And number two, whatever I go through in this life, no matter how dense the fog is or how curvy the road is, He's going to sustain me through it all. Jesus tells His disciples, this is a great promise. In verse number 12, He tells His disciples, they will do greater works than He. Look in verse number 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on Me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Can you imagine 
what the disciples are thinking now. Lord, you're telling us that we're going to do greater works than has already been done? Well, listen, that makes the water even uh, muddier, right? Lord, what are you trying to tell us here? You see, Jesus wants them to understand that he's not going to disband their group, but he is expecting them to continue their work in a greater way. After the coming of the Holy Spirit, they did just that. For example, there were more converts, think about this, and I learned this and I thought about this this past week as I studied this passage of Scripture. There were more converts as a result of Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost than there were at any one time during Jesus' ministry. Think about that. It's called the power of the Holy Spirit, right? Right, class? What has to happen before the coming of the Holy Spirit? Jesus has to leave, right? And then the Holy Spirit comes, amen? Jesus never made converts outside of the Holy Land. Think about that this morning. He never made converts outside of the Holy Land. But by the time the last disciple, John, died, the gospel had spread all over the Roman Empire. And Christianity was spreading. And people were being redeemed. Finally, Jesus says, If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Verse number 14 of chapter 14. This means the ability to, even, to do even greater things would originate in prayer. The promise to do anything we ask in His name doesn't mean we just end our prayers in Jesus' name, amen, and that everything that you and I ask comes to pass. No, that's not it at all. Every Bible promise has a premise. Remember that. Every Bible promise has a premise. The premise of this promise is whatever we ask must be consistent, must line up with the character of Jesus, it must line up with the very name of Jesus Christ. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 explains the principle of asking God to do things in our lives and receiving what we ask. And, this, and here's what 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 says. And this is the confidence that we have in Him. That if we ask anything according to whose will? His will. It may be my will, and I may ask for my will to be done, but ultimately His will has to accomplish it. Amen, class? His will has to accomplish it. He says that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. I got to tell you this, this, this morning, class. I'm a firm, solid uh, believer today, but I put a lot of emphasis on praying to the God of heaven, don't you? I put a lot of, I put a lot of emphasis on praying to the God of heaven. Not just on the weekends, but every single day, I find myself talking to God and praying to Him. Verses 15 through verses 31. I'll let you do the reading there. Jesus says if we truly love Him, in verse 15, we will keep His commandments. It's not enough just to say that we love Him. We must live His commandments. And in verses 15 through verses 31, we read much about the power of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says to help us obey Him, Jesus says, And I will pray the Father, and He shall give you another comforter, that He may abide with you, how long, class? Forever. Listen, life down here can beat us up. Amen? Life can be hard. The consequences of it can be difficult. But Jesus says, I'm going uh, to promise you the Comforter, 
and He will do many things in your life, and that He's going to abide with you forever. Verse 17, Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth Him not, neither knoweth Him, but ye knoweth Him, for He dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. Guess what, class? When we got saved, the Holy Spirit not only came along uh, side of us, He also came in us. Amen? And the Bible says, He came in us to dwell in us for how long? The Bible says, forever. The word translated comforter, comforter there in, in verses 16 and 17 means that there, this, this Holy Spirit of God comes alongside of us to help us in our journey, to help us through our struggles, to help us through our fears, to help us through life. He comes along to aid us. The Holy Spirit today is our comfort. This means He is always present in times of need. He is in us in all, at all times. He's not going to leave us. He's not going to forsake us. He's in us forever. And thank God that He is. Amen? Because we all need comfort. We all need help. We all need strength. We all need direction. And the Holy Spirit of God, the powerful Holy Spirit of God, makes that happen. We all think it would be nice if Jesus could be with us visibly or physically during the frightening times of life. However, if he were, we would not be able to, to be every once, to be every place at all times. Listen, think about it like this. When Jesus was in human form, he was only able to be in one place at a time. Right? He could only be one place at one time. Here's the great promise. Here's the light switch going on. Now in the person of the Holy Spirit, He is everywhere at once, and even though we can't see Him, He is beside us, and He is in us. Man, Jesus Christ, think about it in this fashion this morning. Jesus Christ is at work today at the same time as we're having service here today. Jesus Christ is at work all around the world. Amen? You know why? Because of the Holy Spirit of God. That's why. Jesus explains it like this in verse 18. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. The word comfortless in the Bible there is the word from which we get our word orphans. Jesus just as tells us that just as physical babies need parents, we need a spiritual parent, don't we? Yes, we sure do. Next, Jesus tells his disciples the word, the world won't see him anymore, but the disciples will, verse 19, referring to see him after his resurrection. Man, I'm glad God is a God of promise, aren't you? And when, God says he's going to just, when God says he's going to do something, he does it. He also tells them that they will know he is in the Father, and the Father in him, and I in you. It was referring to the coming and dwelling of the Holy Spirit of God. In the person of the Holy Spirit, Jesus now makes His home in the hearts of people like you and me. And I'm so glad that He does. Amen? In fact, one of the things that the Holy Spirit of God does for us is that He lets us know when things are in our lives that should not be there. Right? It's called the conviction of the Holy Spirit. God lets us know when we're wrong. By the way, if you can live a life of wrong and never hear the voice of God and never feel the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, there's something wrong. Amen, class? we got a Heavenly Father, and He loves us, and He cares for us. And we can mess up big time down here. But the difference is this, that as children of God, God lets us know that's wrong, and we need to make it right. The people who belong to the other family... Satan's family, they can live that way. But the people of God are going to feel and hear the voice of God. Amen? 
The Holy Spirit of God does that for us. The Bible says in verses, uh, Matthew verses 26 and verse 27, Jesus says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth. Remember that phrase? Listen, this world can only give you temporary of anything. And sadly, there are many today who are tricked into the, 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 the traps of Satan and they find peace for a little while. But then it's gone. The Bible says that Jesus, I, Jesus says, I'm going to give you peace not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. The word peace there in verses 26 and verse 27 is not referring to an absence of conflict or problems, but it's referring to a calmness of spirit based on the confidence that we have in God. I got a strong confidence in God, don't you today? I've trusted Him for many years, and He's always come through. The Bible says it is a peace, understand this, that the peace that Jesus gives us here, it's not a peace based on circumstance. Please understand this. It's not a peace simply based on our surroundings. It's not a peace based on uh, uh, the, the culture that we're in. That's not what it, the, what it, is, it is about. It is a peace based on Christ. Why is that peace always there? Why is that peace today something that abides forever? It is because Christ is not going to change on us, amen? He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So when I have this peace in my life that the Bible says passes all understanding, it is because of none other than Jesus Christ Himself. This peace is a supernatural peace that the Bible says passes all understanding. I can't explain it. I just enjoy it. Amen, class? I can't explain it all. I've seen in my journey, I've seen Christians go through some very dark days and still have the joy of God in their heart and the smile of God on their face. Haven't you? Guess what makes that possible? It's a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's the Holy Spirit of God living on the inside that makes that Jesus come to the outside. Amen? That's what makes the difference. It is a peace based on Christ, not on circumstance. And by the way, according to Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22, this peace is the third component of the fruit of the Spirit. It's quite interesting. In Romans chapter 15, verses 13, Paul prays a beautiful, insightful prayer for believers. Here's what he says. Now the, the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. What a wonderful prayer to pray for people when they are facing a terrifying problem. God will always answer. It may not be exactly as we would understand it. It may not exactly be on our frame of time, but God will answer. Jesus says, in verse number 30, Jesus says the prince of this world is coming, but he has no power over him. Man, the God I serve today is above every name. Amen? He's above every name. Then Jesus says, but that the world may know that I love the Father as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Verse 31. In other words, Jesus is going to the cross because it's God's will. He's not going to stay there. He's going to overcome that. He's going to leave. Thank God He's coming back. Amen. Thank God He's coming back. The Bible winds down this chapter. Jesus says, Arise, let us go hence. They leave the upper room and they begin walking across 
the Kindred Valley to the Garden of Gethsemane where soon Jesus Christ would be betrayed. As the Prince of Peace this morning, Jesus deserves not only our obedience, but He deserves our trust. We must trust Him every single day of our lives. Today we have a blessed hope. We have a great promise. Yeah, Jesus left, but He's coming back. And I'm glad that when He comes back, I'm on His team. Amen? In fact, I'm on the right team now. But the manifestation of it has not fully been lived out. But one day, heaven's going to be reality. Amen? It's going to be reality. And all the Sunday school lessons and all the sermons you've heard preached through the years about heaven, you're going to live them out in real time. Amen? Because you're going to be there. Father, we thank you today for the wonderful, magnificent, powerful promise of John chapter 14. God, I thank you today that you're preparing for us a place that we cannot describe. God, thank you today for the great promise of your soon return. Thank you for the Comforter, the Holy Spirit of God that lives within the heart of every true believer today, that comforts us, that gives us peace, that guides us through life, that works all around the world, even at this very hour. The Spirit of God is at work. God, I pray for that Spirit of God to speak to our hearts right now. I pray, God, you would teach us all. God, I pray today I've said something that's been encouraging to your children. God, I pray I've, I've said something today that will teach us further the great promises of the Word of God. God, I pray for Pastor Joe now as he comes to preach in a few moments. You would give him the words to say. God, I pray today that if there's someone in a Sunday school class, maybe even this class today, someone who will come to the next worship hour that's yet to receive the Holy Spirit of God into their life, God, I pray today that this will be a day of spiritual renewal in their life. And we'll thank you and praise you for it all. We ask and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being in our, worship, our Sunday school class this morning. We're going to main worship service in about 15 minutes.